Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to this fourth session of this TechNet 21 webinar series on temperature monitoring, keeping a cold chain cold. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome our guests who are going to discuss equipment monitoring systems, EMS, the future of interactive cold chain performance monitoring. Um, our guests today are Isaac Kopina from WHO PQS, Denis Denise Habimana from the WHO PQS as well, Karuna Luthra from Gavi, Omileye Toyobo Chai, and Brian Pal from New Horizons. During the presentation, you can ask your questions in the Q&A box, preferably. If you cannot find it, you can ask in the chat box, but preferably in the Q&A box. Don't hesitate to ask questions all along the presentation. They will be answered by the panelists after the presentation during the Q&A session. As usual, this session is recorded and we'll share the links to the video as well as the slides by email and on the TechNet21 website. Uh, I will share the links uh, in the chat box during the presentation. Karuna, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Alex. Hello, everyone. Um, next slide, please, Denise. Great, so we're very excited today to talk with everyone about the new technology spec EMS. And as you know, in the series so far, we've been talking through different temperature monitoring technologies. And today we're looking a bit broader and towards the future with equipment monitoring systems, um, which look at a more holistic CCE performance monitoring. So after the introduction, I'll be handing it over to Isaac from PQS, who will talk a bit about what WHO PQS is. Um, then Brian will be talking through the more technical and engineering perspective as to exactly what is an EMS. After that, Omale will talk with us about how to use the data generated by EMS. And following that, Isaac will talk a bit about the timelines for how we see EMS coming on the market. And I will speak to Gabby's position and specifically the CCOP perspective on EMS. And all throughout today's uh, webinar, we're going to have a mentee survey. So it'll be a bit interactive, hopefully. And then um, we're really interested in your feedback and opinions on the various questions throughout the different sections. And then finally, at the, the end, we'll still have time for a Q&A. So please do put your questions and comments into the Q&A box. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. So to start us off, as I mentioned, we'll have a mentee. So please go to mentee.com and enter the code that you see here. And we can also put the, I'll go ahead and also put the code in the chat. So when we move on, everyone will be able to see that. So I'll just do that. Perfect, okay. So I hope everyone has had a chance. So to start off, we just have a few questions to understand where everyone is coming from. So the first question is, which country or countries do you work in? I'll just give everyone a, a second to get to the mentee. And please let us know in the chat if you're having any challenges with the mentee. Yes, we have some additional comments from uh, other countries in mentioned in the chat, which are not showing here in, uh, in mentee. Maybe let's go ahead and move to the next mentee question. So we're also interested in understanding the background of the various participants in today's session. So if you could go ahead in the mentee 
and let us know either your job title or function or even the sector if that's a bit easier. Looks like we have again about 13, 14 responses. Um, so thanks for those that are putting the responses in the chat. If possible, if you could use the mentee, that way we can capture it, that would be great. Um, and again, if you have any questions about using the mentee, please also go ahead and put that in the chat. Great, thanks everyone. So maybe let's, let's move to the next question. So now we're gonna get into more of the content of the session. So before I hand it over to Isaac from WHO PQS, we just wanted to check if, if folks are aware what does PQS stand for? So it looks like we're having a number of responses and, and most of you do know, so it is. So Denise, do you wanna get, go ahead and, and show the correct answer? Yes, so PQS stands for Performance Quality and Safety. And now I'll go ahead and hand it over to Isaac who leads the PQS group at WHO. Yeah, uh, thank you, Karuna. Um, I mean, from the main C questions and responses, I think, uh, we still need to do a lot of work to um, make people know what uh, PQS uh, stands for and what we actually do. I mean, uh, the responses were over overwhelmingly uh, good in terms of uh, people knowing what PQS is, but I think there's still um, a little uh, proportion uh, that needs to be um, briefs on, on our work. So I think this is an opportunity also to, to do that, uh, to start that, uh, that, that work. So PQS um, stands for performance quality and safety um, as the, the right main C question uh, was uh, presented. Um, the, P, the current uh, form of PQS has existed since 2007. Um, uh, and has actually existed in the uh, pre-qualification department of WHO since 2013. Uh, so initially uh, PQS was in the immunization um, vaccines uh, department, which was a bit um, not right at that time because um, there was a conflict of interest uh, for PQS to be part of the program, as well as being a regulatory body for cold chain equipment. Um, next, uh, Denise. So what does PQS actually uh, do uh, when it comes to uh, the immunization uh, work for for countries and for WHO. PQS uh, does two main things, uh, but of course those two things uh, can be divided into further uh, uh, parts. The first uh, work that PQS does is to develop standards for cold chain equipment. 
and by culture and equipment here, um, we, we have all the categories which are, uh, can be shown on the, on the slide at the moment. Um, coal rooms, refrigerated vehicles, which is uh, recent. Uh, we just pre-qualified the first one last year. Uh, refrigerators and freezers, cold boxes, coolant packs, temperature monitoring devices, up to cold chain accessories like um, voltage stabilizers and energy harvest uh, controls. It's important to stress here that we also develop standards and pre-qualify injection uh, equipment for immunization as well as uh, waste management equipment, such as safety boxes um, and incinerators. Um, as I said, the, the current uh, form of PQS, um, it's uh, mainly the development of standards and the pre-qualification of, of equipment based on those standards. Uh, so what does pre-qualification actually mean here? So it means, uh, manufacturers can submit uh, their dossiers based on the standards that PQS has, has published. Um, and the uh, equipment dossier will be reviewed to make sure that they actually meet uh, those standards. Um, the slide you are seeing actually gives a kind of uh, 360 view of that process. So the first a uh, step above, you can see at the top there, is the development of standards. Um, how do we get the information to develop those standards? Mostly it comes from the field, but uh, we all know that uh, cold chain equipment have existed even before the immunization uh, program. So we, were, we are inspired also by what happens in other uh, areas, so, such as food cold chain or cold chain for, um, for other areas. So that user information, let's say a, a country discovers that um, there are different ways, there are possible different ways of actually achieving uh, the immunization program. And if that new way actually needs a technological solution, uh, PQS can develop uh, the specifications for such a technological solution to um, actually make that process more uh, easy to implement. So once those uh, stand, the draft standards are developed, uh, there is a process where the industry actually comes in. So WHO doesn't develop the standards in a vacuum. We make sure that uh, the industry the relevant industry actually has the opportunity to comment on the draft standards. There is also um, opportunity for um, program colleagues uh, to also make comments and suggestions on how they think uh, those uh, draft standards will play out. Uh, this process is followed by an, you know, uh, an iterative cycle of uh, both WHO industry and program where there is various cycles of, of comments going around. So it's not just one round of industry comments. We go back and forth with industry because we want to make sure that uh, those standards actually reflect uh, the needs in the field. So after this process, the standards are finalized and published on the PQS website. And uh, from that point onwards, uh, manufacturers of such equipment can apply for uh, pre-qualification. Okay, so we now move to the next step, which is uh, the actual pre-qualification itself. Uh, Denise, back, please. Okay, so we move to the next step, which is actually the second uh, pre-qualification itself. Uh, a dossier is composed and the uh, PQS team reviews uh, the dossier to make sure it meets the standards. If it meets the standard, then the, the product is listed. But that is not the end. Uh, there is a third step, which is post-market monitoring. Once uh, we have pre-qualified the products and hopefully UNICEF or other procurement agencies have procured and, and they are found in the country, 
the countries are using these products, we make sure that we try to gather as much information on the performance as, as possible. Um, there is also a fourth uh, step, which is like uh, uh, an innovation step, which is called target product profiling, where PQS looks at the next iteration of the specification based on feedback that uh, they have received uh, from the field. Uh, but I think you'll be wondering how all of this relates to the topic of today, which is uh, EMS, Equipment Monitoring System. I remember we had a PQS working group meeting some time back, and, uh, and our, one of our colleagues, Solo, uh, most of you will know him. He asked a question that, uh, why uh, is the fridge uh, not serving as the repository for data, for temperature data in the program? And this is because um, it's possible for temperature monitoring devices to move from one fridge to the other. And at times uh, this creates confusion. Um, and also these monitoring devices get uh, lost in the, in the program, in the system, but the fridge actually stays for a long time in a, in a, in a health facility. So taking the, the function of temperature logging uh, and recording from the external uh, RTM devices to the fridge is going to give us um, more security in the data and also more stability in uh, you know, having data which uh, shows the performance of the fridge over a long period of time. So that gave us uh, the inspiration to come up with uh, the equipment monitoring system, which we are actually discussing today. Um, so this will uh, lead us to our colleague, Brian, who will be giving us the technical uh, aspects of this uh, new uh, temperature monitoring system we are developing. Over to you, Brian. Thanks, Isaac. Next slide, Denise. So I'm going to go through an overview here of the EMS system from a technology and functionality perspective. Um, and first off, EMS, as Isaac and Karuna mentioned, stands for Equipment Monitoring System. And this is essentially um, what PQS envisions the future of cold chain monitoring looking like. And the targets, as Isaac just talked through, are to really integrate the logging of data into the refrigerator and also to include critical administrative information so that when data is reviewed either locally or remotely. There's access to information around uh, what, what refrigerator it is, what model, when was it made, and more diagnostics information uh, than just temperature. A modular data interface for local data access and upgradability um, so that the monitoring equipment can be upgraded over time and data standardization for interoperability. So the data from these systems can flow into any a relevant ELMIS or a program data system that's desired. And to achieve EMS functionality, it really breaks down into the three components that we see at the bottom of the slide here. First, there's a monitored appliance that has some sensors built into it with data logging capability, a standardized data connection that's built on USB so it's easy to access, and then optionally some advanced display and remote data transmission capabilities uh, in, a in a function that we call equipment monitoring device or EMD. So we'll see that throughout the deck. Next slide. So really these functions that we're talking about here break down into a bit of a hierarchy that we'll be referencing uh, throughout the presentation today. So I wanted to introduce that on this slide. So if we think about this as building up a, a pyramid from the bottom up, first off, of course, we have to have fridge, cold storage, and sensing. Um, there, of course, has to be safe, reliable storage of vaccines for any of this to matter. But then if we come into the EMS functions, level one EMS is data sensing, recording, and local data access. So this is essentially just recording and uh, logging and recording data and making it available for download over that um, standardized data connection. And then if we move up to level two, this is where there's a local visual display so that users can see current temperature, uh, alarm state, and alarm history. And then if we build up to level three, this is where we add a remote connection so that data can now be transmitted to remote servers um, for uh, SMS alerts and things like that. Next slide. 
So let's take a little bit uh, of a deeper look into what is built into each of these EMS levels from a more technical perspective. So if we jump to that first basic EMS level one, this is just the integrated sensing and local data access. Uh, essentially what we uh, have here is a refrigerator that has some sensing built into it. So uh, a door sensor, temperature sensors, information about the compressor operation and power availability status. And all of those data are feeding into a data logger that's built into the refrigerator that has a USB data download where data can be accessed uh, either by local users using a smartphone or laptop or by uh, an, an equipment monitoring device via the level two and three functionality. And the really key thing that is built into this level one functionality is that the 60 day summary reports that users are used to seeing say from fridge tags or other 30 DTR loggers are similar to what you find from these fridges, except there's additional diagnostics and administrative information available on those reports. So now things like door opening information, power availability and compressor runtime, as well as error codes can be available on those reports so that as technicians are uh, accessing data from a fridge, they have much more information to inform what the failure causes of the fridge might be. For example, if a fridge isn't performing well and somebody walks up to the fridge, downloads data from it, and sees that power has only been available for one hour per day for the past month, then it's very clear that the refrigerator shouldn't be expected to be performing well. And it's likely not a refrigerator problem, it's just a power availability problem. Next slide. So now as we step forward to EMS level two, this is where an equipment monitoring device um, functionality is added. And I, we should be clear that this could either be integrated into the refrigerator or it could be a separate module uh, like we see here that plugs in over that USB. But regardless of whether it's built into the refrigerator or separate, the fridge still has to have that USB interface so that local users can download data. And this local communication EMD builds in a display that allows for local review of data um, and alarm status with an audible visual alarm indicator. Um, so the users don't need any hardware such as a phone or a laptop to be able to see what the status of the refrigerator is. Next slide. And then when we jump to EMS level three, um, this is where remote communication is built in. So the data can be delivered to ELMIS type systems, dashboards, and to feed into remote uh, alerting and reporting. Next. And for all EMS levels, um, we've done a quite a bit of work with industry to define a standardized CCE data set so that as data are moving around through these systems, all the parameters are consistent and named uh, the same so that data can flow into all these different reporting systems in a consistent way. Okay, next slide. So going back to that hierarchy of data access, um, if we think about the use cases that this enables and the procurement implications, let's start off with level one. So this is that basic data sensing, recording and local data access. If a refrigerator just has level one EMS, the use cases that are enabled there are that techni technicians can see diagnostic data, they can view error codes using their smartphone or laptop. Um, reports can be downloaded from, from refrigerators um, with an Android application such as Varo or potentially ODKX, tools like that, and transmit those reports to their managers or to ELMI, ELMIS systems um, more manually. And those fridges can be plug and play upgraded to the more advanced levels two and three uh, after installation. So there's an intended level of procurement flexibility built in where if a country isn't ready to jump to level two and three functionality right away, they could potentially upgrade to that over time. The procurement implications of level one is that this is intended to be the lowest cost because it's the lowest feature set, but we still maintain that full diagnostic data availability and upgradability to the other levels. And this might be a best fit for EPI programs that are either most cost sensitive or where visualizing and transmitting data using a smartphone satisfies their key use cases. They don't necessarily need the local visualization or remote transmission on the fridge. Then if we jump up to level two, in addition to all of the level one use cases, this also adds local users being visually and audibly alerted to alarms and they can intervene or call for help um, from that information. The procurement implication, of course, is that this is expected to be a higher hardware cost than level one, um, but since there's no remote transmission in this one, there wouldn't be a monthly fee for data transmission. And this might be a best fit for EPI programs where remote response and coordination of interventions are unlikely, but local users are best empowered to identify problems and uh, call for help or to transmit data using a mobile device. And then building up to level three capabilities, 
course, we still maintain all of the use cases at level one and level two, but this adds use cases where remote users can see performance via a web portal and they can be automatically alerted to alarms and can remotely coordinate interventions. Procurement implications here are that uh, it would likely be a similar hardware cost to level two, uh, but adding a monthly fee for data transmission. And this might be a best fit for EPI, EPI programs where data reporting and response protocols are more robust. Next slide. So with that introduction, let's jump to a quick mentee question. And the question here is, um, what, which of those three EMS levels that we just talked through do you think is most needed or valuable to strengthen equipment monitoring uh, performance? Is level one adequate or do you see uh, substantial additional value in level two or three building in the local display or remote communication indicators? Okay, so we have a few responses coming in here, generally pushing more towards level three with the full remote capability built in. A couple also on both EMS level one and two. And one key thing to call out um, is that even if EMS level three is built in where you have that remote connection, we've still looked to really empower the local users with data download access so that they have access to all the information that's available remotely. So they can still download via USB uh, and access all those information locally. And so we'll give this just a couple more minutes. Uh, again, weighted more heavily towards EMS level three, having that remote capability built in. Okay, it seems like responses have mostly come in now. So let's jump to the next slide. So this is just a quick look at some of the data elements that would be available via EMS, regardless of the level uh, of the refrigerator uh, of the EMS system. And the thing that I wanted to call out here is um, for both mains powered appliances and solar powered appliances, there's a number of administrative data objects uh, that would be available so that as a report is downloaded or being reviewed remotely, full information about the appliance, date of manufacture, model number is available to be able to coordinate, say, uh, supplier questions or warranty claims. And then when it comes to monitored data objects, there's a whole lot of data objects that are built into the specification in terms of optional data objects, but the required ones are really just a few key ones that have been determined to be diagnostically useful uh, for the refrigerator. So that's ambient temperature, power availability, compressor runtime, door opening data, and compartment temperature. So these are intended to be the most useful uh, parameters to indicate why the refrigerator might be performing the way it is. Next slide. So overall, the key features that we work to build into EMS is standardized fridge monitoring and maintaining that local user data access so that we're not skipping local users with a remote monitoring system, making sure there's more complete and accessible data uh, in every fridge, so adding administrative information about the refrigerator and environmental conditions, enabling program flexibility and choosing a preferred level of functionality. Of course, this is contingent on suppliers providing all of these options, whereas um, suppliers to be EMS compatible can provide only level one or all the way up to level three. Uh, so it'll be important for countries and procurers to send the right signal to suppliers about what levels they really like. And that was one of the uh, objectives of that mentee question earlier. Uh, we built an essential local communication with a remote option. Um, is where an EMD will have both an on-site display with optional remote transmission, um, EMS being future ready and flexible, so that with that data connection, um, the remote monitoring functionality can be added or upgraded over time. Even if in full EMS level three is built in, that USB data connection means that as new EMD modules or remote monitoring modules come online, the bridge could be upgraded over time. And then lastly, but potentially most importantly, being information system integration ready so that remote software systems um, can pull in these data and pull them into reporting systems that countries are using. Okay, next slide. So let's take a look at some of those features and just think through uh, which of these do you see as being most valuable and we should call out many of these could be um, uh, selected. So you don't necessarily have to narrow down to a single one but what are the functions that you see as being most valuable?
Okay, so pretty good range of options here, or range of selections here. Seems like standardized monitoring and local user data access is a priority. Um, simplified integration with program management information systems is a priority. Having on-site displays and alarms being uh, available is important. Seems like less focus on the program flexibility and choosing the preferred level of EMS functions. But for the most part, the other options are fairly popular. And thanks everybody for the input here. This is very valuable feedback um, to be getting about where people uh, see the functions of EMS being most useful. Just a couple more seconds to get the last inputs here. Okay, I think those have slowed down. So let's move forward. And now I'm going to hand it over to Omile to talk through sort of the downstream implications of EMS and how this can be utilized in program systems. Thanks so much for Brian for taking us through the technical aspects of EMS. Um, hello to everyone around the world and thanks for the opportunity to speak to you all today. So I'll be diving into the use of EMS over the next few minutes. Next slide. So EMS has really been designed to meet the cold chain and vaccine monitoring needs of immunization programs. And it aims to do this by effectively generating, recording, communicating, and turning a huge wealth of this data into actionable insights. And we're gonna look at this through two key functional domains. Firstly, countries can use EMS to monitor the entire network of their cold chain devices and inform management and planning decisions across all levels of the supply chain. Secondly, they can also access user performance data to manage operations such as maintenance planning and troubleshooting to ensure that these equipment are functioning at optimal capacity. So we're gonna unpack this a bit further and look into some of the potential benefits and some select examples of how this data can be used for action. Next slide. So firstly, um, EMS has the ability to provide advanced information and accessible visibility into an entire network, as we just said. And with such extensive data available, EPI programs can generate valuable insights to manage your coaching throughout the entire life cycle, from when you install it down to when you have to decommission it. So what are some of these potential benefits? Um, we can actually get an in-depth understanding of the, the functionality of your equipment. If you have a thousand equipment, you're able to actually identify what percentage of these are performing according to the WHO PQS specifications. And you also have features to track the assets through GPS co-location. Secondly, you have visibility into the staff use of the appliance. DMS actually has the ability to provide um, alerts or alarms to actually tell health workers when they're not using the equipment properly. So for example, if a fridge door has been opened for too long or the solar panels have not been cleaned, you can actually get some form of you know, error codes or diagnostic sensing to actually modify end user behavior. Also, you have visibility into the safe temperatures that your vaccines have been exposed to. So EPI managers are able to understand when there, were, that there was downtime of equipment and if this had any impact on vaccines. Some tangible examples that we can see here is by having access to local and remote visibility, someone at the national level, for instance, can actually look at the entire fleet of equipment actually conveniently update their coaching inventories. Most times we have to do manual visits or travel to sites to actually perform coaching inventories with EMS data. If this information is available on the central EMS, ELMIS dashboard, you can actually update your coaching inventory in real time with objective data. You can also use this information to verify installation. Um, so we are all aware there's a lot of post-installation inspection going on of coaching equipment. We also want to be able to commission them to confirm that they are working 72 hours after deployment. Data from the EMS can actually help EPI programs manage this to save you time, cost, and logistics to having to visit sites physically to conduct these commissioning assessments. Uh, another key example here that we find very valuable is that managers can actually track KPIs. A lot of um, information, a lot of push is going towards being able to actually track KPI performances of our coaching systems. And the EMS actually gives us the ability to do that by looking at our entire fleet of equipment to identify what percent of them are functional. And if there are any issues, we can actually mobilize resources or create targeted action plans to help resolve them and bring the whole 
coaching to an improved state. So this is a clear example of the value that EMS can actually bring and some use case examples. Next slide. Another key thing that um, Brian also mentioned was the ability to do diagnostics. And I think this is a key feature that EMS will really bring because it, in, in a way for me, this, this um, helps us to understand, have a better awareness of the fridge health um, in our coaching system. So think of it as a heart monitor. The EMS has multiple sensors that actually goes to different parts of the fridge. So you can monitor the compressor runtime, you can monitor if power availability is being provided to the fridge, and you can also monitor if a solar panel has not been cleaned or if the door has been, not been, op has been open for too long. So information like this can also assist healthcare workers to do basic troubleshooting, as you can see from some of the pictures here. Also beneficial here is the fact that technicians will now know exactly the components of the fridges that might have issues. So they can locally download data from the EMS enabled fridge to see what issues the fridge was facing, or they can log in remotely to get some of these alarms and predictive text so that they can actually see what specific components might be failing. And they're able to actually visit the sites with the right spare parts that they need to change them. So EMS actually unlocks a different level of information that we typically might not have been getting before from 30 DTRs or RTMDs. And this information can be used to improve our maintenance planning and troubleshooting so that we can have the right diagnostic and the right spare parts to make our fridges work better. Next slide. So we're gonna have a quick mentee here um, just to check with our audience, which functional areas would benefit most, the EPI the most from EMS data. And I think we'll give about um, one minute um, to get your responses. Looks like there's a lot of interest in, in the maintenance and troubleshooting. Give it a few more moments to get more feedback for moving on. All right, thanks everyone. I think we can move to the next slide. So I'll be talking briefly about how EMS data can also be applicable across existing coaching planning tools or platforms. Um, first and foremost, and for me, this is a, a low hanging opportunity for EPI programs to tap into immediately once EMS comes online. EMS data can be shared into government approved immunization LMIS systems. So for instance, if a country has level two or level three EMS functionality, provided the right APIs are available and the data ownership principles designed by Gavi are followed, this can provide nationwide visibility into an entire network of EMS enabled fridges so that EPI managers can actually look at the spectrum of audio equipment on their dashboards and use it to make informed decisions. And by virtue of this um, quality interoperability, EPI managers can actually do objective evaluation of how their equipment are performing and actually take management um, steps because they have information at their fingertips. So they can sit down at, the, at their monthly review meetings and look at the entire network of fridges and actually determine what actually needs to be taken to keep um, them having 90 to 95% functionality on their KPI. So this actual low hanging fruit and an, an immediate step that EMS could enable if countries opt for level two or level three functionality. Next slide. Um, the second platform where EMS data can prove valuable is for something called post-market monitoring or PMM. Um, PMM was set up by WHO PQS in the last few years and it essentially utilizes a Sentinel surveillance system to monitor the field performance of CCE in countries post-installation. Especially now that we're deploying a lot of CCO privileges, we want to be able to get feedback about how these fridges are doing in the field. And we've never really had a systematic way to do this. So EMS has a, a potential to help us unlock that visibility. 
And the aim is to develop a feedback loop where data from health facilities can actually be synchronized or be uploaded into a CC database by, that is managed by WHO to help us strengthen our emerging PQS specifications, as well as provide account, actionable feedback to hold manufacturers accountable for warranties and drive product improvement. Now, the way PMM works is that typically PMM thresholds are set to identify malfunctioning fridges, looking at the number of heat and freeze alarms that equipment are experiencing. And we typically get this data from 30 DTR, but we also realize that 30 DTRs have some limitations with battery life, and that you might also need to first send the data through a Varro app. So you could do this as one option if you have level one functionality, but if you have level two and level three functionality, data from EMS can actually be accessed um, centrally, and this information can actually feed into the PMM um, evaluation system. Um, the root cause of failure of many of these fridges can then be troubleshooted. As I mentioned, that EMS provides data that they can use to do maintenance, diagnostic, and troubleshooting. So once we identify fridges that might be you know, performing non-optimally, countries can actually conduct the root cause of failure analysis. And the, and the issues that were being experienced from these failures can actually be escalated and identified so that PQS can actually use this information. So if it's a manufacturer product fault or quality defect, you know, we can hold manufacturers more accountable and improve the specification. So data from EMS can actually flow into this PMM system and actually help us boost the feedback system that we, that we so readily desire. Next slide. Um, an additional and third platform is something called the Integrated Maintenance and Planning Tool or IMPT. Now what IMPT does, and this was set up by, by Gabby, is it aggregates and analyzes cold chain performance data across different manufacturer brands and models. So for instance, with data coming from the EMS, you can actually compare device uptime or performance across you know, different models. So you can look at three or four different models that you have in your country and actually compare side by side to see how they are performing, to understand if it's a user-related problem or if, or, or if it's a device issue. And you can actually use this information to inform you know, your future decisions. You can use it to inform your maintenance planning. And countries can also use it to decide which brands or models work best in their context. And that can inform if they decide to procure certain equipment or not. Uh, coaching or decisions really can also use this information to determine where they should deploy certain equipment. We've seen sometimes that certain equipment might not work but in some geographical location. So the IMPT really is a maintenance planning tool and procurement tool that EMS data can actually help um, provide insight into and countries can use this information to make their you know, procurement decisions in the future. Next slide. Um, so you know, we've talked about a few platforms. We've talked about the ELMI system, which is a low hanging fruit the post-market monitoring system that WHO manages and the IMPT. But we might realize that there might be other opportunities and other um, um, access points that EMS data can be beneficial for. So we really want to hear from you. This is an open-ended question. What other ways could EMS data benefit immunization programs that we might not have considered so that we can sort of take this back into our planning and, and our structuring to see how we can target the EMS to be able to add that value to EPI programs? So I'll give you guys um, about a minute or two to see if we can get any direct responses that will be very valuable for us. We are also happy to take um, offline feedback um, as well, but it'd be great if we can get some engagement on the forum as well. So please use the mentee um, where you can. So we're seeing some comments about resource mobilization in the chat. So again, I'll implore the team. Fantastic, we're getting some engagement. Nice. We'll give it about 30 more seconds.
fantastic. Thanks. Um, so now we're going to be, I'll be handing over to Isaac to chat to us about the proposed timelines for when EMS would be on the market. Thank you guys very much. Over to you, Isaac. Thank you, Amelie. So just uh, one minute to go through the timelines. Um, so at the moment, what we are doing is um, we've just received the last or the final feedback uh, on the EMS specs from industry. And we are currently finalizing the specs for publication, which we hope to do uh, sometime in January next year. Uh, once the specs are published in January, uh, we give manufacturers two years to be able to do their research and development, such that uh, in January 2024, um, EMS will become a requirement for pre-qualification of new fridges. So any new fridge or new application that comes from January 2024, will need to comply with the EMS uh, specifications. And then in January, 2026, so two years after uh, that, um, all fridges, even those which were pre-qualified before January, 2024, will have to comply with the EMS uh, specification. This means that um, manufacturers will have to do some retrofits of their currently pre-qualified equipment in order to stay pre-qualified. Uh, so that's uh, what I had in terms of timelines. Uh, we hope to um, meet these timelines uh, very, very, very rigorous, rigorously. So um, over to Karuna, I think. So lastly, I wanted to give an update on the Gavi position on EMS. So of course, as, as most of you would know, Gavi only supports the procurement of PQS certified equipment and UNICEF is the procurement agent for the Alliance. So as any, so, so two kind of main updates. So as any EMS systems, whether it's integrated into a fridge or it's a standalone EMD, or it's a fridge that is equipped with the level zero yeah, or the level one EMS is available, has been pre-qualified and is available for procurement through UNICEF, then these would be CCOP platform eligible. And then secondly, in terms of, of um, the CCOP platform eligibility requirements and, and what would be required. So obviously we will comply with the timelines from PQS, but in addition, we are also considering if there should be any requirement for CCOP supported fridges to have to be EMS um, to have the EMS in it as, as described through the specification ahead of the January 2026 timeline. So we will keep folks posted on any developments there. There's not a decision yet, but we are considering if the timelines for CCOP equipment should be accelerated. And then lastly, in terms of which level of EMS functionality would be CCOP eligible, we're currently looking at levels two and levels three. Um, and so just a, a sort of advance notice that this is where Gavi is most interested in. So having the local data access through an EMD or the um, both the local and the remote data access also through an EMD. We don't currently have a position or a preference on if the EMD should be integrated into the fridge or could be a standalone, similar to our current position on RTMDs where we procure and, and both standalone and integrated RTMD as platform eligible. We anticipate that this would be the same for EMS and the EMD. And then lastly, um, with the CCOP program and generally through UNICEF, all of the equipment that is procured by Gavi or through UNICEF, the country is, is the owner of that data. And the same would be, we would have that same position for EMS. So any data gener generated through a fridge um, would belong to the country and we would consider the country the owner and, and having ownership rights over that data. Okay, thank you. Um, so next slide. So we have a few questions in terms of, of general interest in EMS. So the first question is, do you, with the immunization programs that you work with either in your country or the countries you work in or the countries that you supply to, do you think they would be interested in procuring CCE that has EMS functionality at, at any level? Great. 
so this this is great feedback, and and I think we're overall pleased to hear that most of you, actually all of you so far, agree that this would be of interest and useful for immunization programs. I think we can go to the next slide. And so this is sort of a free response. So please type your answer in. Um, and we're looking for feedback as to which factors you think would influence immunization programs decisions to procure CCE that comes with EMS functionalities. So this could be anything from the design, what's monitored, what's the cost, what are the timelines, does it align to CCOP sort of application timeline. So, so any sort of factor that you think would be important would be interested to hear your feedback. Ah, and I see a question in the Q&A. So what is the meaning of CCEOP? So the CCEOP is the cold chain equipment optimization platform. And it is basically the Gavi Alliance's investment in cold chain equipment, primarily at health facility level. So mostly ILRs and SDDs. And in, in what we call the Gavi 4.0 period, which was 2016 to 2020, there was an investment of $250 million into cold chain equipment jointly invested with countries in this current new Gavi strategic period of 2021 to 2025, an additional $150 million plus country joint investment is, is still being invested into cold chain equipment. And the eligible Gavi supported countries can apply based on their different cold chain equipment needs and based on what equipment is currently CCOP eligible. Um, and I can, I'll put in the chat, um, or actually into the Q&A, some links to where you can find out more information about the CCOP. And um, with that, so we have only a, a few minutes left. So we will move quickly to the Q&A where we have been seeing a few questions so far. Um, and I know some have been answered uh, through, through, um, through typed answers, but maybe we can quickly move through these questions. So the first question I see is, can EMS be installed in more than one cold chain equipment? Um, Brian, do you wanna take that question? Sure. Um... Currently, no. The answer is that EMS is intended, an EMD module is intended to be uh, connected to a single refrigerator. Of course, each refrigerator can have their own EMS module, so EMD module. So if you have a number of refrigerators in a room, they all should be able to be EMS compatible. Thanks. And the second question is saying the so their understanding of these EMS levels that are dedicated to monitoring data collection, but what is in place for maintenance? My observation is that the failure of CCE systems is not due to surveillance, it's due to maintenance problems. Most projects have never received funding for maintenance. Um, so sort of in response to that, I would say uh, two things from, from my perspective at, at Gavi. So one is that actually for countries that are eligible for Gavi support, the Gavi HSS grants actually can be used to fund maintenance if a country chooses to um, put that into their, their um, programming plan. So for, for some countries, I would, I would say that that's a, a fair point, but there are possible sources of, of financing both domestic and through donors. And then secondly, for EMS, our hope is that countries will actually use the data generated as they see the performance and different causes of, of performance issues to help um, build that into their maintenance plan, whether that's for the budget or whether that's for how often or where maintenance resources might be needed. Um, but I'll ask Brian and Omale to um, add on to this answer. Yeah, yeah and I think you got it right, Karina. I think um, one of the main things that we're missing from, from maintenance is the visibility into the data and what is causing this breakdown. So with more data, we are empowered to understand what kind of maintenance is needed, then we can budget and cost accordingly and put a plan in place to then seek funding for it. Over. Yeah, I completely agree with you guys. I think everybody realizes that data alone doesn't solve problems, but it can be very empowering. And if we can uh, provide more effective data that can show what the failure causes are, then that can empower funding and maintenance resources to be able to target interventions. Oh, Karuna, you're still on mute there. Thanks. So actually, this is a question either for you, Brian, or for Lei. So it says, what predictive analysis is possible with EMS? 
Um, this is a really interesting question, and I think this kind of gets at the bleeding edge of remote monitoring and what's possible with it. I know some suppliers have been particularly interested in using some machine learning or AI-based tools to try to get at um, failure modes via just a temperature data stream. Um, but I think there's a number of failure modes that with an enhanced data set should be possible to be able to uh, identify ahead of time. And one of those is solar power availability. Uh, what we've seen is that when solar panels start to get clouded over with dust, you can start to see in the compressor uh, speed on solar fridges that they're not able to get to maximum speed. And before the fridge is able is uh, really impacted from a vaccine management perspective, you can start to see that signal in the data. And so that could inform a remote alert to be able to go clean the modules ahead of when vaccines are compromised. Just to add, uh, Brian uh, and colleagues, that uh, we don't envisage to incorporate uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence modules in the EMS. But we hope that the data which is generated can be exported and actually you know, analyzed by, of course, the experts who, who can do this analysis. Over. Thanks, Isaac. That's a great point. Okay, so I know we have just a few minutes left, but looking at other questions. So one says, they guess each CCE refrigerator manufacturer will have its own RTM or EMS system. Is there a way that the user can be able to log onto one dashboard and visualize all the EMS from the different manufacturers in the same way and download the same kind of reports irrespective of manufacturer of EMS, I would imagine, or manufacturer of, of the fridge? So, I would, maybe, Lay, do you want to take this one also? But um, yeah, I, yeah, I could give it a shot and hand it ELMIS. Over. Yeah, I think you'd have a good perspective. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that we're trying to do with EMS is to make this supply agnostic. And our vision is if you if a country had three or four different equipment brands with different EMS systems in them, if the, the data can all be uploaded into an ELMS system, then a the EPI can actually log into that system and actually view you know, the performance of each of these fridges, irrespective of which supplier EMS process is. So we're trying to build some flexibility in here and some interoperability where you can look into the different products despite them being from different manufacturers. But yeah, Brian, over to you to add some additional technical flavor there. Just the data standardization and interoperability that's built into this system is really intended to empower what Omile was talking about. So that if there isn't a significant data translation or interpretation exercise required for each of these platforms where the data are being visualized. Yeah. That's great. Okay, um, so I know we're just about at time. I'm, I'm looking through quite a few of these questions are a bit technical or referring back to the um, sort of the technical aspects of, of EMS. And we will be circulating the slides and a recording of this webinar next week. So hopefully that will give you a chance to go back um, and answer or, or sort of see the answer to some of those questions. Um, so if I can just take maybe an extra one or two minutes to, to look at some of these other questions. So we've had a few questions in here that are asking about SIM cards and, and how this will work in terms of connectivity and that they might be expensive. So just say that we are noting, um, you know, these are issues that also arise for RTMDs, I think on, on the Gavi side and, 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 and sort of the Alliance in, in general as a funder, right? This is things that we have also looked at and we'll be taking into account as we're looking at what is our approach to RTM and EMS in the Gavi 5.0 period, especially looking if there are ways to make it easier for countries and programs. Um, so, so noting the feedback and questions around that. Um, there's a question here about are there data standards and, and you'll see the answer to that in the presentation as well that yes, there have been systemized data standards, data standards created for EMS as, as Brian presented in the, the technical overview. Um, there's also a question here about if at level three users get the display module, um, especially at the lowest point of the cold chain. And Brian, do you wanna to talk to that? I, I think the quick answer is that it's it's not related to what point of the cold chain equipment is going to, it's related to what uh, level of EMS the country has selected. Yes, and level three does include a display, so yes. Yeah. Great, okay. Um, and with that, I know we're right at time. So we'll, we'll just say thank you to everyone for all of the questions and, and please feel free to email or contact any one of us that's on this panel with any additional questions or suggestions. We, you know, we really appreciate everyone's feedback and, and apologies, we don't have time 
to quite answer all of the questions. Um, and uh, just again, a thank you to each of the panelists here today for the presentation and engagement and, and taking the time and to all of you for participating in this webinar. Um, so back over to you, Alex. Thank you very much, Karina. Thank you, everyone. That was really a great presentation. Um, as a reminder, we'll send you the links to the recording and the slides by email, uh, probably on Monday. They will also be made available on the TechNet 21 website. I put the link in the chat if you can find it, because there's a lot of engagement, which is great. Um, next week, next week is the last, uh, last webinar of this series that has been uh, really a great series. Um, the, the topic next week is connecting the dots using CC temperature monitoring data to improve cold chain systems and maintenance practices. Same time, same place. Uh, you don't need to register. Uh, you just use your, um, the, 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 same, uh, the same link, the same passcode. You will receive the, a notification by email anyway. Um, and uh, that's it. So thank you very much again. And uh, we hope to see you next week. Have a nice, good, oh, have a good rest of the day and stay safe. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Bye.